All right, Mark 6. Um, Luke, in his gospel, he records an incident early in Jesus's like public ministry. When Jesus shows up in his hometown of Nazareth on a Sabbath day, and as is his custom, he enters into the synagogue, and in the synagogue on Sabbath day, he's invited to read from the Old Testament, specifically from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And so Jesus, he stands up in the synagogue in Nazareth, he unfolds the Isaiah scroll, and he searches for this spot, and he gets to the spot that he's looking for. In our Bibles, it's Isaiah chapter 61, and he reads what Isaiah says. He rolls up the scroll and sits down. And for a moment, everybody's like really cool with the scripture reading that Jesus chose, right? They're fine with it until Jesus says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And when Jesus said that, people in the synagogue in Nazareth on that Sabbath day, they lost their minds, right? That statement, it was just too much for them. Those gathered, they realized that Jesus was claiming something radical, something revolutionary even. And once they began to process that, they realized that they couldn't take it, right? And so Luke then tells us what happens next. This is what he writes in chapter 4, verse 28 and 29. He says, when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and drove him out of the town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. Now keep in mind, these are people in the synagogue in Nazareth. That's the town that Jesus grew up in. Now the Bible tells us Jesus was born in Bethlehem, right? But he grew up in Nazareth. Scholars would also tell us that Nazareth in the time of Jesus, like maybe like 60 acres or so of land and only about 500 people living there. Which means... In all likelihood, every single person who was in the synagogue that day knew Jesus. Like they had a personal relationship with him from his lifetime lived in that village, right? They had seen Jesus growing up. They had known Jesus as he was learning his trade from his father, Joseph. They had a relationship with him. And yet still, despite that relationship, these are the people who are so enraged by Jesus' teaching and Jesus' claims that they tried to kill him. They brought him to the brow of the hill so that they could throw him down the cliff. Isn't that incredible? How do you think Jesus felt in response to that? I mean, we're talking about the divine son, God himself in human form and human flesh, How do you think he felt to be rejected so decisively by his own people, by his neighbors, by his friends, even by some from among his family? Right in life, the wounds that are most painful are the wounds that are inflicted by those who are closest to you, right? We all get that. Right, if someone who has never been to Life Church, who has no affiliation with our church family in any way, if that person decides that I'm a terrible pastor, I'm not going to like that. But you know what? I'll shrug my shoulders and we'll roll with it. If you, the people who sit under my preaching and leadership week after week after week, decide, you know what, Sharp, he's really full of it. I'm tired of listening to that dude. That's going to sting me a little bit more if I'm honest. If my wife, Kristen, wakes up one morning and she says, you know what, James, I think it's time to consider a career change. I'm going to feel that on a different level because the wounds that are most painful are those that are inflicted by those who are closest to you. We get that. And here it's the people who are closest to Jesus, his own childhood friends, his neighbors, even his own siblings, who thought that he was so unhinged and dangerous. They thought, you know, the best thing that we can do with Jesus, we can toss him off of a cliff. And I'm like, how do you think Jesus felt in response to that? However he felt, it's interesting to note and compelling to note that in our passage today in Mark 6, Jesus, he decides to go back to Nazareth. 
But he went back to his hometown, to the people who, at least twice already in the recorded Gospels, have rejected his claims and his teaching. Maybe, Jesus is thinking, things will be different this time. Now he's revealed his divine power in undeniable ways, right? He's calmed storms. He's cast out demons. He's defeated disease and even death itself. Maybe this time, in light of the power that he's demonstrated, the Nazarenes will listen. In our passage today, there are two distinct sections, really two miniature stories But I want you to realize that those stories are tied together by a common theme. And actually, that's a theme that bleeds into the story that we'll study together next week. That theme is rejection. Today, we're going to see Jesus rejected at home and Jesus' disciples rejected in the world. So contempt at home, contempt in the world, rejected at home, rejected in the world. Let's see this. Mark 6. Read beginning in verse 1 with me. Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? And so the people in Nazareth, they have heard of what Jesus has done. They've heard of his mighty power, and now they're beholding his teaching. And if we were to stop right there at the end of verse 2, we'd think, you know, maybe Jesus was onto something. Maybe this time the people of Nazareth were going to receive him. Maybe they're going to believe in him. Maybe they're going to follow him. Mark tells us they're astonished at his teaching, bewildered. They respond in wonder. How did this untrained carpenter come to know these things? Right? How did this boy that we once saw roaming our streets as a child now grow into a man who's capable of performing these mighty works? Maybe Jesus' friends and neighbors and even family members are going to turn to him. But if we keep reading, we see in verse 3 that the curiosity quickly transitions to contempt. They continue to ask, Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? Now, what happens right there, it's subtle, but I want you to notice exactly what the people in the village in Nazareth are saying about Jesus. Right? I mean, they're saying, we know his sisters, they're right over there. We know his brothers. But did you hear what they called Jesus? They called him the carpenter, the son of Mary the son of Mary. We don't get it because in our culture, it wouldn't land this way. But in Jesus's culture, that's a dig. That's an insult. Because in Jewish culture, men were identified not by their biological relationship with their mother, but by their relationship with their father. Right? Legally speaking, Jesus was the son of Joseph, not the son of Mary. Legally speaking. But the townspeople, they don't mention Joseph at all, do they? And it's surely intentional. These town people, they seem to be lingering on the mysterious origin story of Jesus. Right? They're lingering on the tale that has been told about Mary's miraculous conception, about the fact that she and Joseph did not know one another before she conceived the child. They're thinking, oh yeah, this is that guy. I remember that story. Now Jesus, he's showing up teaching in wisdom and power, and they're thinking to themselves, who is this fool? This illegitimate son, not of Joseph, this illegitimate son of Mary, this man with no earthly father. Right? We have a word for that in our language. It's not a nice word for that kind of person, for a person who has no earthly father. If I said that word when I was a kid, my mom would wash my mouth out with soap These people are saying something ugly about Jesus. And Mark makes that clear, right? If we keep reading in verse 3, he adds, and they took offense at him. Now, the Greek word that our Bible translates offense, the verb in Greek, it is skandalizomai. And I say that to you not to sound smart, but because I think you can hear skandalizomai. You can hear our word scandalous in there. That's what Mark is saying, 
Mark's saying the people in Nazareth, they were scandalized by Jesus. How does he respond? Verse 4, then Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. I want to make sure we don't misunderstand verse 5. Right when Mark tells us that Jesus could do no mighty work there, he is not in any way putting a limit on Jesus's power or on Jesus's omnipotence. Right, we've just seen Jesus calm storms and resurrect dead people. Right, he is not now stumped by the obstinate unbelief of a few random villagers in Nazareth. Jesus was not physically unable to demonstrate his power. Rather, he was morally compelled not to demonstrate his power. It's important that we know this, that the only limit on Jesus' power is Jesus himself, right? When the Christ hung on the cross and was taunted by Roman soldiers, they yelled at him, if you really were the son of God, then you could bring yourself down off that cross. But the only thing that prevented Jesus from unleashing angelic armies in that moment to deliver him from that awful moment, the only thing that restrained Jesus and prevented him from saving himself from the cross is Jesus himself. Right? Jesus has unrestrained and unending and unlimited power to do what he desires to do. And the only thing that can curtail or restrain Jesus' power is Jesus himself. And so in Nazareth on this day, when Mark tells us he could do no mighty work there, what Mark means is that he did not desire to do so mighty a work among people of such hardened hearts. People who are so resistant to his teaching and to his claims and to his person. He could do no mighty work there because he would do no mighty work. The only limit on Jesus' power is Jesus himself. But notice the point of this whole exchange here in Nazareth. We see it in verse 4. Jesus says, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. In other words, familiarity breeds contempt. But among those who know Jesus so well, with whom Jesus is so familiar, there's rejection, there's contempt. Elsewhere for Jesus, there may be honor, but in Nazareth, there is none. A prophet is not welcome in his own hometown. I mentioned a few weeks ago that um, I spent some time earlier this year um, in my hometown, the quiet Dallas suburb of Bedford, Texas. Um, I was there for a workshop, but one afternoon there was a break in the workshop. And so um, I went out for a jog, like just kind of through the neighborhood that I had grown up in, in that part of the city of Bedford. I jogged past the the house that I once lived in. Um, Some other family or other families have lived there for a couple of decades now, but you know, the house I grew up in, it's still standing. I can tell you 3816 Berkshire Court, still there. I ran down the street from that house to the house on Dorchester Drive that uh, my friend Brian Patrick and his family once lived in. I remember just the regular rhythm of summer afternoons when I was in middle school involved playing on Brian Patrick's Nintendo 64 in his upstairs game room. That was like every single day of the summer. Um, Yeah, anyway, I, I will never forget that, I don't think. I ran from Brian's house Um, I can't remember the name of the street anymore, but I remember the way. I ran from Brian's house past the house that was once occupied by David and Michael Paulus. David and Michael were twin brothers that I graduated from high school with. David went from high school to the United States Air Force Academy. Michael went from high school to the United States Naval Academy. They always had a little rivalry there. I haven't spoken to either of the Paulus brothers in decades. In fact, the last time I spoke to them was the tragic day when Michael called me to inform me that our mutual high school friend, Chris Elder, had been killed in a car accident. Their house was still there. I ran past it um, and then ran a couple of miles across the city to the house where I'm told 
my good friend Jeff Green's parents still live. They've lived in that house since the early 90s. Jeff is significant to me because we were friends for a long time in high school. He's also the man that the Lord used to open my eyes to the good news of the gospel. We graduated from high school. Jeff asked me, James, you want to you read the Bible with me? Um, and for some reason, because of the prompting of the Holy Spirit, I said yes to that question. And so Jeff and I, we sat a couple of times a week and we read through 1 John together. And I would ask questions. He would answer those questions. And through that process, the Lord opened my eyes to the reality of my sinfulness and my need for a Savior. He allowed me to respond to the gospel in saving faith. And so I'll always remember Jeff and always be grateful for Jeff. He and I have spoken a couple of times in the last few decades, but ran by his parents' house. There it was. I don't make it to Bedford, Texas very often anymore. Um, And I'm not the kind of person who thinks that there's like much benefit to like reliving the good old days, right? If you're a Christian, that means glory is in front of you. Like if you're a Christian, the best is always yet to come for you. And so who cares about looking back at high school and remembering what the way things used to be? But it did strike me as I was, you know, running the streets of Bedford, Texas, that like most of the people that I remember from that city, from my hometown, most of the people that I remember, they would be somewhat shocked to see me now. And by that, I mean, they would be surprised by the way the Lord has worked in my life, by the things that he's called me to do, by the role I now serve him in. They would be surprised by that. In fact, like if I were to walk into the living room of Jeff Green or Brian Patrick or David and Michael Paulus and and just start preaching, I'm pretty sure that those people would be scandalized. It's not because I was a hooligan in high school. I really wasn't. Like, I I kept my nose clean. I was a pretty good kid. Um, I wanted, like, teachers to like me. And so I stayed out of trouble for that reason and that reason alone. But the simple truth is that, like, you know, the Patricks and the Pauluses and the Greens, they remember who I was. I feel like, actually, I kind of need to go back and apologize to everyone that I knew when I was in high school. Like, that seems like it would be just the best thing that I could do, right? I remember how much of an obnoxious tool I was when I was 18 years old. And I would love to just go and apologize to people who are on the receiving end of that. (laughs) This is not in my notes. Actually, I remember at one time, this is sort of random, but it's on point. Like, I remember um, interviewing a guy for a job, right? He wanted to be the youth pastor of the church I was serving in. And uh, I had known him since he was like 16 or 17 years old. and, And he just goes, man, James... I cringe every time I meet somebody who knew me when I was in high school. I just want to apologize for who I used to be. And I totally resonated with that because I was like, I know, I wish I could do the same thing. Some of you, you're stuck in your hometown, and so you continue to rub shoulders with the people who have known you since birth. That's not the case for me. Most of those people have no vision of the man that I have become. And so if I were to go back to that place today, they would be like, James Sharp, really? And that makes sense because I was a jerk a lot of the time just in subtle ways, right? Persistently narcissistic and self-centered and ego-centered. I mean, I was, I was a jerk because it was before I knew the Lord, before the Lord's miraculous power was working in my life to refine me of my many, many, many character deficiencies. Where am I going in saying all of this to you? Well, if you think about James Sharp, a prophet is not welcome in his own hometown. That makes sense. Yeah, a prophet is not welcome in his hometown because my hometown people, they know who I was and they have a sense of maybe even who I still am. But think about our Lord Jesus for a minute. When Jesus is baptized in Mark chapter one, right, he he enters into the water and we hear this voice from heaven and the heavenly father declares to him, You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. And the father declared that because Jesus had lived up to that point and every moment following that point, he had lived a perfectly sinless life, which means every moment of every day, Jesus thought and felt and did things that honored the Lord and he never thought and never felt and never did something that dishonored the Lord. Right? Every, every iota of his existence was an act of delight in and worship to God himself. And so when Jesus enters the water for baptism, the Father declares his celebratory praise that is deserved by his one and only Son. 
And so think about Jesus roaming the streets of Nazareth as a child, right? Like he never struggled to share his toys with his brothers and sisters. He never argued with his friends. When the hooligan children of Nazareth snuck into the synagogue to drink from the Passover wine, Jesus was not among them. And don't you think the people of Nazareth would have noticed that? Don't you think that there would be something unique and distinct about this young man, despite the questions about his origin? Don't you think they should have realized, man, there's something different about this Jesus? So when he showed up preaching in the synagogue, they would be like, yeah, you know, that makes sense. We kind of saw this coming. We should have realized in advance that Jesus was going to be this special anointed prophet and maybe so much more than that. But they didn't. And so the sinless one, he comes home, not for the first time. He preaches with wisdom and with power. And the people of Nazareth, they were scandalized. How can that be? Well, familiarity breeds contempt. The closer you get to something or someone, the more comfortable you get, the more casual you become. It was precisely because they knew Jesus so well that the people of Jesus' hometown could not imagine that what he said he came to do or who he claimed to be was true. It's because they were so familiar with him. The people of Nazareth, they faced what we face, what C.S. Lewis famously called a trilemma. Because of what Jesus said and did, there are only three possible conclusions Either he's a liar, he's a lunatic, or he is exactly who he said he was. And for Jesus' neighbors and friends, and even some in his family, they just couldn't believe that the Jesus they had known for years was the Son of God. Here's how this danger translates to us today. Right? Familiarity, it still breeds contempt today. But for us, the danger is not that we are physically familiar with Jesus. The danger is that we are spiritually familiar with Jesus. The danger is that we will become so exposed to glorious transcendent truths about who Jesus is that we will actually somehow become bored by those truths. Like, church, this struggle is real. First service this morning, sitting over there, after the Lord's Supper, we're singing, Is He Worthy? This song picturing, like, the gathered assembly around the throne of heaven, declaring the worth and glory of Jesus for all eternity. Because when you see Jesus as he is, that is the only way you can rightly respond to who he is and what he has done. The song is declaring over and over and over again the worth of Jesus. And in my heart, I'm bored. Because familiarity brings contempt. I knew I was going to preach about this. And I still was not spiritually prepared to come with the, with the sensitivity and the, the brokenness that we need to bring to the things of God. And so in the same way that like the custodian, the janitor at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City can be bored with the you know, glorious and beautiful paintings that are on the wall because he walks by them every night. We can become bored by the beauty of Jesus, right? In the same way that like a park ranger at the Grand Canyon can be so accustomed to walking through scenes of transcendent glory that we can lose our sense of awe and wonder at the transcendent glory of Jesus. We can get bored because familiarity can breed contempt for us too. What happens in your heart when you think of the cross of Jesus? What happens in your heart when you think of the perfect, righteous Son of God who deserved nothing but worship and adoration for eternity when he willingly went to the cross for you so that you might be welcomed into the kingdom of heaven forever? What happens in your heart when you consider that? 
And see, my guess is that you've heard somewhere between a dozen and a thousand dozen sermons on the cross of Jesus Christ. Has familiarity with that topic bred contempt for you? Have you lost your sense of wonder or awe or joy in light of the cross? What happens in your heart when you ponder the grace of God? When you ponder the unmerited favor and love and acceptance that God has shown you, not because there was anything about you that was particularly good, and not even because God peered into eternity from outside of time and said, oh, yep, sharp, he looks like he has potential. I'm going to show him my grace. No, what happens when you consider the fact that God chose to shower his grace upon you simply because of the goodness that was in him and not because of any goodness that he foresaw in you? Like, what happens when you consider that? And you've sung in your lifetime one song or a hundred songs or a thousand songs about the grace of God. You've attached to the grace of God words like amazing and great and wondrous and reckless and rightly so. But has familiarity with so great a reality dulled your senses to just how awesome that reality is? Is God's amazing and wondrous and reckless grace old news to you? Is it something that no longer stirs your heart? Or is it even maybe something that has never actually stirred your heart? Like maybe you show up in places like this one week after week because you agree intellectually with what's going on here. You say yes to the truths that are being prayed and sung and proclaimed. But the truth is, that's an intellectual thing only for you. And you've never loved Jesus. You've never responded to the good news of his grace with your affections. We can become so familiar with the things of Jesus that we're numb to the things of Jesus. Notice how Jesus responds to the villagers, right? Verse six, and he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. That's one of those verses that actually makes me tremble a little bit. He marveled because of their unbelief. If you've been reading Mark really closely, you might notice that that's a word that Mark uses regularly to talk about how people are rightly responding to Jesus. Right When Jesus teaches, people marvel. When Jesus heals, people marvel. When Jesus calms the storm, people marvel. In chapter 5, when Jesus cast the demons into the herd of pigs, everyone marveled because that's the right response to what Jesus is doing. But now, it's Jesus who marvels at the unbelief of his former neighbors and friends and even family members. And so he leaves Nazareth and he goes to other villages teaching of his coming kingdom. Friends, I pray that Jesus would not marvel at our unbelief. I pray that he would not marvel at the number of times the truths of who he is have been declared to us, only for us to be bored by those truths. In verses 7 to 13, so 1 to 6, Jesus has rejected contempt at home. Verses 7 to 13, Jesus, he commissions and sends his disciples. And just as he's rejected, he prepares them to be rejected. In other words, the followers of Jesus are to expect opposition from and rejection in the world when we do his work. Let me walk through that. We'll give verse seven. And Jesus called the 12 and began to send them out two by two, and he gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. Okay, and so just the quick version of this. Jesus sends his disciples in a posture of total dependence upon God. 
right? Take nothing for the journey. Travel light. No extra cash, no change of clothes, no rolling suitcase, because God will provide for your needs. That's the the vision there, verses 7 through 9. Verse 10, the disciples aren't to prioritize their own comfort while on this journey and on this mission. Jesus said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there in that house until you depart from there, from that village. And so the custom in the time of Jesus, you know, before there are hotels and inns and Airbnbs, right? The custom in the time of Jesus, when a traveling teacher would arrive in a village, like a family would welcome that traveling teacher to stay in their guest room, in their home. But sometimes if that traveling teacher proved to be really good, like then other families in the village that maybe had nicer homes, they were more comfortable, more affluent. They would then invite the traveling teacher to leave the first home and enter the second home. And a traveling teacher, it was sort of a, a symbol of his notoriety or his, his ability to teach, like if he just kept moving from house to house to house because he kept getting better and better and better invitations. Jesus says, none of that. Your comfort and your prestige are not the issue here. It's about the kingdom and the message that you declare. Finally, verse 11 Jesus prepares his disciples for rejection. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. In other words, be prepared to be rejected. Verse 12, so they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. Why should the disciples be so ready to be rejected on the mission that Jesus gives? Why should we today still be so ready to be rejected on the mission that Jesus gives? Well, the simple answer is that the gospel was scandalous then, and it's still scandalous now. Like who Jesus is and what Jesus claimed to be and do, scandalous then, and scandalous now, right? The gospel teaches us that we were so bad in our sin that Jesus had to die for us. In other words, our sin problem was so deep and so profound and so dark. Our hearts were so wretched that the only solution the God of heaven and earth could possibly provide for our depravity was the death of his only begotten son. People in Jesus' day believed that because they were Israelites, God would show them favor and acceptance. Right? They couldn't believe, therefore, that they even needed a Savior. They couldn't believe that their sin demanded atonement because they were keeping covenant with God, they thought. But the gospel taught otherwise. Right? Jesus came and he proclaimed a message of a different kind of kingdom. And he said that he was going to die on a cross, indicating that they needed a different kind of king. Right? It was scandalous because it meant that they couldn't save themselves simply by being good Israelites. It says that we can't save ourselves simply by being good church folk. The gospel also teaches that Jesus is the only way to be saved, that the only way the just, holy creator of the universe is made for people to be saved from their sin is through faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's the scandal, right? That's the stumbling block for most people in our day. Maybe it's a stumbling block for you. Right? Our culture loves to envision this idea that like everyone's on a different path, but all of our paths are leading to the same destination. Right? That everybody has their own version of truth, but that all of our truths are really just complementary ways of looking at the same big truth. We're all just going to the same place. Our culture loves the idea that you don't need really a savior. You just need to, to live an authentic life. You need to be true to yourself. You need to discover who you really are and live out who you really are. Which is, by the way, our culture just essentially saying that we have the ability to save ourselves. That what we really need to like, get out from under what's wrong with us is the freedom of like, individual expression. The ability to live the life that we really want to live without anyone or anything hindering us. And if we can do that, then we can save ourselves. That's essentially what our culture tells us. But what if... What is inside of you is broken, right? What if your authentic self is actually authentically corrupt? And what if the world is full of people who are broken whose authentic selves are authentically corrupt? See, our world's vision of how we can save ourselves, it doesn't really have anything to do with sin. 
It can't deal with what's really wrong with us. It can't solve our sin problem. It doesn't human history suggests that there really is something wrong deep inside each and every one of us? I mean, just think about human history for a minute. The history of war and injustice and abuse that exists in every culture, in every era. Doesn't that prove that we are broken deep inside? Forget about human history. Just think about your life for a minute. Doesn't your life suggest that there is something broken deep inside you. The messy history of fractured relationships and selfish ambition and greed and hypocrisy that characterizes your life and mine. Don't our lives prove that we can't save ourselves, that we are broken and we need a solution that doesn't come from inside of us but outside of us? No matter how authentically we live, we need a Savior. We need the alien righteousness of Jesus to be credited to us. We need atonement. We need justification by grace through faith. We need the gospel. And that need, man, to claim that is scandalous today, which is why we should expect Rejection, just as Jesus was rejected, just as his disciples were taught to expect rejection, we should expect rejection for the offense of the cross, because the cross is still scandalous today. That's the teaching of Mark 6, 1 through 13. Contempt in Nazareth, contempt in the world. Jesus rejected in Nazareth. The followers of Jesus rejected in the world. All because the scandalous gospel of Jesus Christ is still scandalous today. Where do we go from here? Well, months ago, um, when I was studying for and preparing for this series, um, I came across a passage in a book that I flagged and I turned back to that passage this week and I was reading it again and reflecting on it again and it was still convicting to me all these months later. And so I really thought that this would be a helpful way for us to set up our time at the Lord's table in Holy Communion together this morning. This is, uh, this is from J.C. Ryle, who was the Bishop of Liverpool, England around the turn of the 20th century. And what Ryle did, he actually wrote Um, like some study notes for his own congregation, like pastoral reflections for his own congregation on the gospel of Mark, so that when they were studying Mark together, they would be able to read their pastor's study notes on the passage. And those study notes have been handed down to us today. Um, Often they're really, really helpful. I thought this was really, really helpful. And so let me close with J.C. Ryle's final reflection on Mark 6, 1 through 13. This is what he wrote to his people and what the Spirit of God has preserved for us today. Rael wrote, let us observe in the last place, what was the doctrine which our Lord's apostles preached? In other words, when Jesus sends his disciples out two by two by two to proclaim something, what was it that they were proclaiming? He says, we read that they went out and preached that men should repent. Rael goes on. He says, the necessity of repentance may seem at first a very simple and elementary truth, and yet volumes might be written to show the fullness of the doctrine and the suitableness of it to every age and time and to every rank and class of mankind. I'll pause right there. What Rael is saying is this may seem like basic elementary stuff, but this is the stuff we need the doctrine of repentance. He goes on to describe it. He says, it is inseparably connected with right views of God, of human nature, of sin, of Christ, of holiness, and of heaven. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All need to be brought to a sense of their sins, to a sorrow for them, to a willingness to give them up, and to a hunger and thirst after pardon. Does that describe you this morning? Do you have a sorrow for your sin, a willingness to give up your sin, 
a hunger and thirst after pardon from your sin. All, in a word, Ryle adds, need to be born again and to flee to Christ. This is repentance unto life. And then Ryle asks the question that each of us must search our own hearts today to ask. He inquires, have we ourselves repented? This, after all, is the question that concerns us most. It is well to know what the apostles taught. It is well to be familiar with the whole system of Christian doctrine. But it is far better to know repentance by experience and to feel it inwardly in our own hearts. I'll paraphrase. It is well to be familiar with the things of Jesus. But it is far better to know repentance by experience and to feel it in our own hearts. May we never rest, Ralph says, till we know and feel that we have repented. There are no impenitent people, unrepentant people, in the kingdom of heaven. And then finally he concludes, all who enter into heaven have felt, mourned over, forsaken, and sought pardon for sin. This must be our experience if we hope to be saved. Church, is that your experience? Have you felt and mourned over and forsaken and sought pardon for sin, for your sin? Pray with me now. Jesus, we pray that we would know you, but we pray that we would know you in a way that does not lead us to a deadly familiarity with you. We pray that our familiarity would not breed contempt, but it would breed awe. So give us a sense of who you are that is deeper and more intimate. May we know you better. But as we know you better, may that produce in us a sense of worship. And if we discern today that it doesn't, if we discern today that familiarity has bred contempt in our hearts, I pray that that would be the means of grace by which you bring us back to you and keep us in you. And I pray that right now, in a moment in this space, that our hearts would return to you and we would delight in you again. We pray that in your name, Jesus. Amen.